All right. So, so before we dive in, let's just say why we're doing this kind of episode. It's been requested before. People want to sometimes want to hear what we think. Don't just interpret some philosophy. Do some synthesis. And we've gotten this question in particular, what is philosophy for? But that's not why we did it. We actually did it because we're trying to write a book. And after trying to write chapters independently with some success, some not success, we thought we would try coming up with a chapter just by having a dialogue and transcribing it and then editing that heavily. So you may eventually read something that sounds very familiar should you listen to this episode. <laughs> That'll be uh, quite a ways down the road. But first... These messages. So, Wes, do you like that uh, podcast, The Partial Examined Life? Yeah, it's pretty good. Probably some of the people listening like that, too. Maybe we should just stop doing it. You think we should just stop? Because I don't think they care enough. Uh, I've considered stopping doing it. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah, and the only thing that could probably stop my stopping would be uh, money. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> That's why one should do philosophy. Yeah, I thought it would pay more. So what are some ways that uh, folks can save this thing and uh, motivate us to keep interested, to keep the green coming at our eyes? It'd be really easy. They just have to go to partiallyexaminedlife.com forward slash donate. And we're encouraging a monthly recurring donation, a subscription. You can basically choose the amount, $5 or more, $10, or if you're really rich and generous, a million dollars. But whatever you donate, that'll help us keep this thing going. And as part of that, you'll get access to PEL Not School, which is a subscriber-only portion of our website where you can connect with other listeners, participate in reading groups, receive access to bonus content, including the audio of reading group discussions. But what if I, I don't have time for any of that crap? I'm not going to participate in online discussions. Then don't. Just subscribe, because if you're listening on a monthly basis, or we put out one of these things every three weeks, it's got to be worth at least $5 a month, probably a little more. If you can afford that, the enormous benefit to us getting this stuff done. I don't know. I, I kind of, most of my pocket cash goes to hallucinogenic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> you can also mail us your hallucinogenic mushrooms at, what, what's our address again? Oh, don't know. We have already are reading the con. That's quite <laughs> enough of that. That's right. All right, so the question is, why do philosophy? Is that the question? Isn't it? Well, what does it mean to do philosophy? What does it mean to do philosophy? Why do it? Those are almost the same question. If you give a shitty answer to one of them, then you're not going to have a good answer to the other one. Well, I guess this isn't an answer, right? But one of the conceits that we have is that philosophy, in doing philosophy, isn't a profession. Right. It's why philosophize. Why ask philosophical questions? Why spend your time thinking about these questions? Why read things? Why talk to people about it? Etc. Hmm. Well, I'll start by saying that it's not clear to me that I made a choice from early on in my life, not just in my so-called academic career or philosophical career. I had this compulsion to explore, I guess you would call it the foundations of arguments or the rational basis for things. I was always interested in understanding sort of the logic behind what somebody was, somebody's position or an argument or a point of view, and then also what that position committed them to. And sort of being agnostic as to the outcome, I was always curious about understanding the assumptions the logical rules, the argumentative statements, the positions, to get a sense of what somebody really stood for and then what that also committed them to. And I don't think I understood when I was younger that that's what I was doing. But upon reflection, that seems to be what was of interest to me when I was uh, you know, a teenager and even further than that, and certainly going into college. And philosophy just seemed to be the field of study where you could spend your time looking at the foundations of beliefs and opinions. And so, in a certain weird way, philosophy wasn't necessarily an avocation or a field of study that I chose, but it seemed to be most in line with what I was naturally drawn to. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you said you were drawn to looking at opinions or beliefs. Is that what you just... 
Yeah. So, you know, when I was in high school or college, somebody would say like, oh, well, I have this political belief or whatever, and I'd want to query it. I'd ask, Mm -hmm. what about this? What about this? And I wanted to get to the point where I understood where I could make them commit to other things, I guess. So there was a little bit of rhetorical assholeship in there, too. Young Seth Crates. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, in describing your motivations there, you get it. One of the core things about what philosophy is and why it's important, and that is this notion that we run around in society with all these cherished opinions, right? There's a societal group think, there are mores, there are things that are sacred and things that are taboo. And philosophy is one of those opportunities to subject those to to actual scrutiny, because often they're quite irrational, the things that people take for granted and the things that people take to be morally sacred and and, uh, especially what they take to be most important in life is often just wrong. So for instance, we've seen this in our podcast a lot with platonic dialogues, Socrates is is really interested in in the fact that the prevailing kind of wisdom of his day, as it is in our day, is that what's best in life is to pursue wealth and power and those sorts of typical materialistic things. And then in a way, you know, it's it's hard to get away from that view. But even beyond those pressures, there's that natural worry about survival. So it feeds right into that. And to do philosophy is to ask this counterintuitive question, well, isn't there a better way to lead life than simply worrying about survival? I feel like we get this idea, at least in my case, of something bigger from religion. Mm. Is that That's how I got into philosophy in the first place, is by having certain religious feelings and being exposed in church to things and wanting to kind of get serious about it and question, you know, I want to make sure this thing makes sense. So from the start, philosophy, unlike what Seth was describing, for me was not something social. Religion is, of course, a social phenomenon. People are presenting beliefs that somebody else has come up with. But the way that I took it was, I want to figure out, according to my own lights, what makes sense. And one of the big things I think I got out of religion was a sense of mission, that there really is something that we're supposed to be doing. And I got the feeling just looking at the adults that I came in contact with, what their jobs consisted in, what they did with their time, that you know, whatever the meaning of life is, whatever we're supposed to be doing, certainly that can't be it. The, the fundamental starting point was probably we as a society are screwed up <laughs> in how we, how we should be living. But I didn't even interpret that as being academic philosophy. It wasn't until one of my friends in high school just kind of characterized me. Oh yeah, you're very philosophical. You, I didn't really think of it that way. And I think that was part of what then got me reading in that area. And I, and I think it was still a long time before I got beyond the model of the, the goal of philosophy is just trying to come up with a grand metaphysical system that not necessarily one that I could argue on somebody else, but that would fit together, that would cohere for me. That sort of came to fruition somewhere in early mid college and any studying I did beyond that (laughs) made it much more difficult to hold on to that sense of mission. So I feel like, you know, my interest was sparked. And so why I do philosophy now is not the same as why I got into it in the first place. Why is it you do it now? It's fun. It's actually, I think a very similar reason why I would find reading science fiction and fantasy (laughs) (laughs) enjoyable (laughs) or you know, surrealist art, or it's just, there's a lot of crazy shit in there. And these philosophers monads, and I enjoy that. And I also like the feeling of very incisively, clearly expressing something or shutting down an argument or making some advance in insight. You know, those things do come. Is there anything at stake for you the way it used to be? It sounds like you don't feel like there's anything at stake right now. I think of philosophy as almost just thinking itself. So yes, of course, anytime I have an actual problem, I want to think about it. And in that case, yes, there is something at stake. But if I'm just reading and thinking about some abstract 
cosmological question or even ethical question, not necessarily that much at stake. You know, in particular, people who study ethics, you know, it doesn't necessarily make them better people. Trying to understand that doesn't necessarily have a direct effect on how you end up acting. It's almost like you end up supporting your pre-philosophical ethical intuitions. I think that's one of the most common areas where we do that. You would be very suspicious of an ethical theory that, you know, I've investigated this and it looks like I should go ahead and kill my family and everyone I know. <laughs> like, no, you're not going to end up with that result. And that's sort of built into the... Well, not just that. <laughs> I was suggesting that that philosophy might be important because it helps us figure out what the best way to live life is or what the best sort of life is. And I mean, along the lines, I think of what you've been saying, Mark, you know, if you look at philosophers, it doesn't seem to be the, the case that they are necessarily better people than, than others, right? Or that they know how to live a better life. So there's immediately this important challenge to sort of philosophy's self-proclaimed purpose, or at least as it was initially described by Plato and, and Socrates, which is to figure out what the good life is and to help us lead that life. I don't mean to imply that if I characterize philosophy as really thinking itself, thinking systematically, that what I consider ethical and the way I act has not been affected by my doing philosophy. Yes, and hopefully it has been so affected. However, there are only a couple questions. Maybe vegetarianism is one of them. That's an active ethical question for me that reading and thinking more about it philosophically really could push me one way or the other. I think those open ethical questions sort of have to already be open for you in some other way or just as a result of your past experience for you for philosophy to have an effect. Wow, really? What, I mean, there's so few open ethical questions for you. You feel like with your own life direction that you're thinking about philosophy actively now could influence which road you're going to take? I just wrote a blog post on another website where I said that nobody uses ethical theories when they, when they make decisions about moral choices. So it would be disingenuous for me to say that I have some sort of more ethical apparatus in place. But I mean, I think there are there are real life ethical questions. It's not of the sort of like, should I A or should I B, but really about how should I do X or uh, how do I face Y. I don't want to say that it's obviously clear when you should reroute the train to kill the one person instead of the 10, you know, which is the cliched limit test case for ethical theories. But just in things like how do you comport yourself and your attitude towards death and the kind of general sense of, for lack of a better word, compassion or distance that you place yourself at with respect to other people in your life on a daily basis. I think those are things where these philosophical theories and where philosophy comes to bear for me in a very meaningful and real way. Yeah. And Mark, if someone were to ask you, well, why aren't you an investment banker? Would you say that philosophy had nothing to do with that? Yes. I think philosophy has played a role in the past. You know, just that very initial question of feeling like most people in regular jobs are wasting their time really then limited mm -hmm. my career <laughs> choices in ways that since I've occasionally regretted. So was career pathing like a live issue for you guys when you were thinking about a choice? It never even occurred to me. Like for philosophy? Yeah, when you decided what to major in or, or what direction to go. I explicitly decided against philosophy <laughs> for, gra for graduate school. Yeah, tell us more of your origin story, Dylan. I went to undergrad thinking of being a journalist or a lawyer. And the school I went to was a sort of social science residential college at Michigan State. And within that social science school, they had a, essentially, a, they had a political theory core. It was called Justice, Morality, and Constitutional Democracy. That's the name of my major. And they read Plato and Aristotle and Tocqueville and Nietzsche and stuff, but all from a political standpoint, political theory standpoint, essentially the relationship between the individual and the community. And I was utterly taken by that. But during that study and in thinking about my education itself, the role of science came up a lot. And part of it was in my education and the kind of general education requirements I had and thinking about a liberal education, which I was trying to get, even though I was at a big university. 
So I decided that to have my education be complete, I would go and study calculus and get my natural science requirement by taking a, a year of introductory physics for engineers. The main reason being is that I didn't like chemistry and even more disliked biology. When I did that, it turns out that I was good at it. I did really well and I got a lot of encouragement and it wasn't so strange to me. I hadn't been thinking about doing scientific work through most of high school, but had imagined when I was younger and had always been a kind of tinkerer, experimentalist, building stuff and things like that. So it was like I sort of found an old friend when I started doing that work. So it was always in parallel then for my last three years of undergrad, political philosophy and physics in parallel. I never was able to, at that time, try to think through the various crossing points in any serious way, but they were always there for me. And, and the main reason being is that if you, you know, especially when you're reading through more modern and political philosophy, is the way in which science is always some kind of authority, either an anti-authority or an authority. And people are always trying to say that science doesn't give you enough of the answers that are the right answers or science is the right answer. And I felt like I ought to understand that a little bit better. So, I knew I was going to go to grad school. I wanted to become a professor. I wanted to continue a life in academia. But I had to choose. I was, you know, do I do political philosophy and go to grad school in that or do I do physics? And I ultimately decided that I would go do physics for practical and philosophical reasons. I was going to get married just a week after I graduated. And I thought that at the end of the day, if I needed to support a family and it was becoming difficult, I would actually be able to get a job in a variety of different places outside of academia if I had a physics degree. And then the philosophical reason was that I wanted to understand experimental science from the inside. What was it like to do? What, you know, did I really think that I knew more about the world when I did an experiment? And why did I think I knew more about it? And in what ways did I not know more about it? And what would it mean to have a foundational claim? And you know, I did experimental particle physics, which part of the reason I did that was the whole claim of experimental particle physics is that you're getting down to what the world really is like at its whatever, smallest level at, at what it really is. And I wanted to sort of see it for myself and understand what it was like. And I thought that I could, if I wanted to go back and think about philosophy stuff later in my life, that would be easier than trying to go do science seriously later in my life. There's, that's the story. So I'm trying to get at these two questions or two motivations, you know, especially if we're just characterizing philosophy as inquiry without limits, you might say. Whereas a given science already has a methodology more or less spelled out, and then you do the experiments to get you to the next step within that methodology. Or maybe you're doing very theoretical science and you back up and you question the assumptions and what you were describing. It's still a philosophical motivation to want to know how did the world begin? What's at the farther reaches of space? Is space infinite? Those kind of cosmological questions. Is that fundamentally different or is it just part of the same ball of wax from this ethical pseudo-religious drive? I mean, for me, it was kind of the same thing that even though I described my motivations as religious, they were cosmological. It was, is there really a God? You know, and that leads very naturally into the scientific cosmological questions. And so I actually, like you, was very drawn to the sciences and it was actually only in the course of my undergraduate education when I took a lot of psychology courses, I took some neuroscience courses. I think the turning point was I did a summer of experimental work where I helped in a biopsychology lab watching videotapes frame by frame as sugary liquids were dropped <laughs> <laughs> through the, the open head. These rats had been given an operation so that they would have a little funnel in the top of their head so you could drop things directly on their tongue. And they'd had some part of their brain removed, I believe. And then I would watch them on the videotape and sort of count how many times they made the various enjoyment motions. <laughs> and this was a serious experiment that was directly in line with a question that I thought was fundamental, which is, why do people prefer one thing rather than another? And part of answering that question was to just figure out what the question actually is and what kind of explanations are available to that. And I found 
that when I got to that sort of detail level, and especially the thought of doing that kind of work to figure out the next scientific step was way too tedious for me. I, I <laughs> needed something more abstract. That was my experience, too. I found all of the laboratory work you know, that I did in high school tedious. Even though I was interested in the sciences, I, I thought I could, well, I can approach it through the philosophy of science and the history of science, which I found really interesting. But to actually be doing lab work, this reminds me of something Stuart Humphrey actually once said. He's a tutor at St. John's, and he was saying, basically, he ended up in philosophy because was too lazy to do anything that involved more than a pencil and paper, something like that. <laughs> be standing up at a laboratory station or to be. So I think what we're getting at here is, is this sort of generalist urge, right? This urge to look at these big picture relationships rather than to be stuck in some very specialized nitty gritty sort of work. To give another science example, I had a, I had a friend, a friend who's a biologist and I thought, wow, just, you know, what a great, and, and a researcher here in Boston, I thought, wow, just what, what a great job and great life, you know, sort of one of these moments where I thought, yes, I should have gone into the sciences and I wanted to go visit the lab to see what she does. And basically I found out that for years now, she's been doing the same experiment over and over again on a new mouse every day. Involving <laughs> killing it, taking its heart out, putting some chemicals in to see what happens with the heart cells and blah, blah, blah. But different concoctions, basically. That's the tedious kind of situation you can end up in. And, but of course, you can end up with that in any, anything that's professionalized that applies to it. And that was one of sort of my misconceptions in going to philosophy grad school, thinking, you know, I'm going to continue on my big picture generalist path when the demand is that you specialize and you do things that, you know, resemble the, the same sort of nitty gritty laboratory situation where you're doing the same sort of experiment over and over again, for instance. I think there's that generalist urge and then this, there's that the professionalization which works against that because you, the real work of moving some discipline forward means focusing on the specific area and doing something, making some very, very incremental steps. There's lots of philosophy that you can go and look at. If you look at the papers in them, they have that tedious incremental activity that yep. you're describing. And, you know, look, I stopped doing experimental particle physics about 10 years ago or so. And one of the reasons that I stopped that is uh, in decided to go to teach at a weird liberal arts college, which for me was a kind of return to doing philosophical work, was um, the day-to-day -day life was just not going to work for me. You know, what I had before me was going on to become a junior professor at a big university, traveling to Geneva or to Chicago for a five-day or six-day weekend once a month for the next 10 or 15 years, which wasn't going to work very well for my family. And it sounds really romantic to be, you know, going to Geneva, but that's not, you know, you're going there to go underground, three stories underground and work in a lab. And then, you know, the big motivating questions for getting into particle physics about, you know, how the world works are very far down the line. Particle physics is so hard to do experiments on now. The theory is way, way out ahead and it takes decades to build an experiment and to then many, many years to take that data and analyze it. Whereas I had sort of naively imagined it, you know, the life of a scientist and other scientists are like this, you know, there are other science that's like this where you have a problem in the, f in the field or a question about the world and you conceive of an experiment and you go and do that experiment and make the measurements and analyze the data and then write a paper and then move on to another one. People do that, but it's much further removed in particle physics. It's just really hard. So, your day-to-day -day life is becoming a computer expert or a materials expert or stuff like that. And I, the baseline was too long. Yeah, I actually, um, while I was at St. John's, I interned at the Naval Research Laboratory because I had this strong interest in physics as well. And yeah, you know, I got an experience of what it's, you know, of basically I learned this 
computer language and I was trying to help with calibrating these instruments that were going to go up on, on board a satellite. Yeah, I got a sense of that sort of day-to-day existence. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go to grad school and do a philosophy of you know physics focus. And I actually wrote a um, kind of proposal or whatever it was that was required for these applications. I basically said I wanted to study foundations of physics, which was a philosophical discipline. So, of course, I didn't end up doing that. <laughs> to give, I guess, to give my origin story, I actually, from a young age, I wanted to be a writer. And I wanted to say that this philosophical impulse is much broader than philosophy, which is what I think Mark was getting at with asking the question of whether, you know, even when you do science or some other profession, aren't you really philosophically motivated. And I think my philosophical motivations were actually more writerly. Like I I wanted to write essays and reflect in a way that I just didn't grasp at St. John's that that's not what a philosopher does, that that's not what a scholar does. Being a writer is being a writer and being an academic is being an academic. So I had that when I was younger. And then in high school, I knew that I was interested in everything but the thing I was most interested in, in was the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I knew that Tolkien was basically a classicist of a sort, or com- philologist, as they called it, comparative linguist. And so I thought, okay, I want to be a classicist. And I went to St. John's because I didn't, I, that was sort of a something I knew of from my family, I, and I didn't have any other direction and coincidentally that that there the word classics was associated with saint john's and then at saint john's you know i maintain this that saint john's is a place where you get to study everything in a sort of philosophical way and so i maintain this interest in everything and i thought well i'm screwed now and the only way to sort of do everything continue doing everything is to go to philosophy grad school you know to get back to this point about this broader philosophical instinct that informs a lot of different disciplines. That's important because, you know, in thinking about this Socratic demand that we live and examine life or that the unexamined life is not worth living, the the concept of examination, you know, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean sitting in a library and setting some very fine point of Nietzsche scholarship for the rest of your life? can't mean that. An examination can't simply mean being a professional philosopher or doing philosophy in the sense of doing academic philosophy. Examination means means something much broader, and it's important to a lot of kinds of things that you would, you would do in life that you, that you would love to do, including, let's say, being a writer. And, and, it, and it goes back to Seth's talk of subjecting these opinions to examination in other words to a mindset in which you you don't assume you know everything or the things that you that most of us sort of take for granted and assume all the time you suspend your your sense of uh surety about those things and allow your your mind to roam in a sense and you can do that as a writer and you can do that in lots of different places. So I'm, I'm relating this philosophical instinct to open-mindedness and, and saying academic philosophy, it, it goes, it's not simply limited to, you know, the question of whether or not to become an academic philosopher. It's interesting to hear, for me to hear, maybe this is a function of my background and maybe I grew up in an atmosphere of privilege or something, but uh, <laughs> the whole be an academic or academic versus some other way of being in the same field never never was an issue for me. I guess I was just kind of on a voyage of discovery without a clear end state in mind. You know, when I was in high school, I took English and history and physics and math, you know, all the standard courses. And in fact, my grandfather was a mathematician got his degree in mathematics, his PhD. My father got his PhD in engineering. And I thought that it was my destiny to get my PhD in physics because somehow I believed that that was sort of the evolution in our family chain. And what happened was 
they didn't tell you, they didn't tell me anyway in high school that physics was really math. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's the thing. I was very good at math and I was very not good at doing experiments. So, you know, the one where you you roll the BB down the th- sled and it hits the carbon copy piece of paper and you measure the dispersion of, you know, that kind of thing. I was very good at the math and not so good. And I thought that physics was experimental. And so I never pursued it in college. I tested out of math. I tested out of science and all the, got into these weird, great books slash broad humanities types programs and um, was never pushed to go pursue the sciences. And I think if I had been, it might've been a direction that I ended up. But so for me, my philosophical bent was always informed by literature and logic in the form of, you know, mathematics, I should say in the form of logic. And I guess a little bit of politics, but not much. And when I was in college, you know, I was very excited to sort of, extend that critical analytical approach that I had sort of mentioned earlier that came naturally to me and expressed it in terms of natural language theory and logic. So my undergraduate thesis was actually on quantificational treatment of modality in multivalued logic, which is a far cry from writing a master's thesis on Heidegger. So you can see that I had my own little turn once I got to graduate school. But I think I was always sympathetic to not necessarily a scientific worldview, but at least an analytic worldview that respected somehow rules of argument and logic. And I still feel that way. I've just very much broadened my appreciation or my tolerance for what constitutes you know, a proposition or a logical statement and so forth. So none of us are mystics. No, I'm not. What do we mean by mystic? I guess when Seth was talking about that the quest of knowing about the world and asking the questions we have, that the direction has been rational, broadly speaking, whether it be proto-scientific or whether it be with an argument. In none of the stories that we talked about, did any of us pursue trying to get closer to the way the world is through drugs or adrenaline, right? At least so far. I was very interested in that, but it's not, but I approached it from a rational standpoint. I was interested that people had these mystical experiences. I was, I kind of read a little of, you know, how could I get into that? But my way of pursuing that was the same way that I was through rational analysis the same way as pursuing any of these intellectual questions. It was not through actually trying, entering into a practice tradition. Yeah. I mean, did, did you ever think, or you, Wes, ever think about becoming a monk? I mean, going through the activity of mystical practice as a way of trying to get a better understanding of the world, becoming a Buddhist or a or a monk or... There are other kinds of activities that aren't as explicitly yeah. religious, but they're mystical in that respect, meaning that non-rational. It's not a good definition, but... Well, here's a... I mean, here's a part of my bio I forgot to include, which is that <laughs> I... <laughs> the drug-fueled adrenaline part? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I was way into drugs. No. I grew up in a family that wasn't really religious, but left to my own devices... I had sort of a little kid's belief in God. I I think, you know, if it's in the air, you know, even if you don't have a religious family, you sort of, I think kids gravitate towards that. So I, and I was in Ireland where all the public schools are Catholic, basically. And I would be in a situation where I'd be take communion, but I refused to do confession. I would have to say every time I'm not a Catholic, so I Really, I was just scared of confessing because I felt guilty about everything, which would made me would, would have made me a perfect Catholic. But I did have this belief in God, this kind of generic belief, and I had this philosophical curiosity in my mom. And the religion, the sort of our family religion, was books, literature, and philosophy, and everything really, but especially literature and philosophy. So I had that sort of reverence for the life of the mind, let's say, and. You know, my mom tells a story about when I was eight and I would ask, you know, why not something, not nothing. 
straight out of Wittgenstein's <laughs> tractatus. And I had those philosophical impulses from a very young age. But I remember at eight, I did have a little religious crisis, basically, and I sort of resisted it. I, I had a crisis of faith where I stopped believing or I was in danger of not believing in God. And I would actually pray to God to help me maintain my, my faith. And it didn't work. <laughs> and when I got to the United States, I was this rabid little atheist, this nine-year-old atheist, materialist, scientismist, and all the American kids, I'd be trying to convert them to atheism and telling them how stupid they were for believing in God. <laughs> and there was that sort of knowing arrogance, like, okay, the world is in principle solved. There's science and I know how things work. And there are, there are no real questions in that sense. I sort of lost my philosophical edge as well. And then my mom, you know, it was interesting. I had some conversation with my mom. This was really like a very important conversation in my life. And my mom is not doctrinaire, but she merely pulled some Socratic <laughs> shit on me where she questioned a few of my materialist assumptions. And suddenly it became a puzzle. Like, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that doesn't, there are some really, there are some inherent contradictions to a purely materialist worldview. And then I was off and running. So with that, then suddenly, and then as far as mystical experiences, I had at St. John's, I had these you know, almost quasi-religious experiences thinking about things. It was, I, I don't know, for me, it was, and I don't know, um, it, you know, unless you've experienced it, how to describe that, but I would just, the, religious in the sense of, wow, isn't the world amazing? That sense, right? To me, there's a mystical tinge to that always, this sort of wonder about the world. And I would have, you know, these really incredible experiences studying and then of late i have to admit i get that with uh my little side interest in astronomy <laughs> where <laughs> for the first time in my life i feel like i know what it's like to be a religious person even though i'm not religious like i know in the sense of my sense of wonder which is all related to astronomy you know which is a weird sounds weird in a way but it's to the fact of let's say the scale of the universe billions of light years and the way stars are formed and just sort of the the fact that the sun is this big ball of fury gas sitting out there in space and the sorts of things that if you start to think about them in a certain frame of mind they seem so implausible and bizarre that you know again it evokes that sense of wonder and i think that converge on the mystical that convert any sense of, wow, the universe is, you know, that's the sense that the universe is actually a mysterious place. That type of experience I'm, I'm increasingly familiar with, which is probably a sign of age, but. <laughs> well, and let uh, me speak up for the, the primacy of the mystical for a minute. It's very easy for us now. And as adults to think about alleged mystical experiences or really any experience of euphoria in purely psychological terms. It's certain chemicals doing certain things in your head, or maybe you have a, a pseudo Freudian explanation of your calling back to the feeling of being in the womb or whatever. But part of this religious motivation that got me into philosophy in the first place was not just a scientific curiosity, but was a life of feeling, which was very much connected to my love and experience with music. So what made church work for me in particular was we had a very good music program in the church. and. You know, on Christmas Eve or one of those occasions where you, you light the candles and you're contemplating the cross and you, you really feel this flush. There was something very primary about that, that I felt like I'm experiencing God. Not that I'm, you know, I did anything crazy, any monk type disciplines to achieve this and actually was very similar. And I was very aware of this to the, the feeling that I would get as a nine year old you know, contemplating the girl that I really liked across the classroom. <laughs> uh, so it's really only a matter of then as you're trying to rationally work out how all these things fit together, that it becomes easiest to say, oh, well, this is a psychological feeling. Certainly it's not revealing the ultimate structure of the universe. It's not revealing love as an ontological force or something. No, it's the fact that 
evolution has made me in such and such a way, blah, blah, blah. But so much of that is post hoc rationalization. And so I can see where people might come from in trying to get back to the primacy of the experience and construct a different picture of the world than I think most typical Westerners have achieved. I don't want to uh, cede the notion of wonder away from, uh, I guess, at least scientific, at least thinking of being a scientist or that activity. This is one of my own gripes about the notion of misinterpretations of the activity of science and the activity of being a scientist is that somehow it purges the world of wonder. And I actually think that it's, it's the opposite and not so different than what Wes was talking about and just sort of thinking about astronomy, but it, it can be true of all kinds of things. Just mm -hmm. trying to understand things about the world and then seeing how mysterious it is. And so, there's a, a way in which the process of trying to understand and being open about that leads to genuine wonder about it. And so, was when, I, when I was saying that we weren't, none of us were being mystics, I I guess I was thinking that maybe part of part of that activity, maybe I'm thinking, in fact, of the professionalization of being a mystic, which has hmm. to do with a kind of radical introspection rather than a looking out into the world. Hmm. So, it's a professionalization of the activity and the structure of one's life, and that avenue would be somehow fundamentally and primarily from within, rather than a kind of resonance and sense of awe and wonder and mysteriousness that is inflected by the world itself. Yeah, um, I think that's that's a good point because there are certainly a lot of people who, in a way, their mysticism or their approach to life is a, it's a rejection of rationality or it's anti, fundamentally, it's anti-intellectual, right? If you are a certain type of religious person. Of course, you know, you can lead a religious life, which is much like a, the life of a scientist or a philosopher, anyone, which is full of curiosity and seeking and say an interest in theology or whatever. But you could also lead the kind of, let's say, fundamentalist religious life, which seeks to simply foreclose all those questions to say, you know, those, those questions are answered for me. And that's what gives me comfort. And in that way, it's not a means to any sort of continued seeking, and it's certainly not a means to curiosity about the world, right? It's simply a quick and dirty solution to the, the human condition, which is so full of uncertainty and the, and the anxiety that that causes. I think that might be, to a large extent, a, a straw man. I mean, the way I see the, the connection between philosophy and religion is that to enter into a religion, you're closing off that if, if you see philosophy as, as basically unbounded inquiry. Now, that doesn't mean that in any given philosophical discussion, you're questioning everything. You have to have a lot of things in place in order to question one thing. It's just that philosophy is flexible. So that one thing that is left in place, you know, so maybe I'm assuming that my experience is basically legitimate or that my reasoning power is basically sound and I'm making some observations based on that. But then I can back off and say, well, but maybe... My reason is failing here. Maybe my experience is failing here, that there's this constant shifting, whereas when you move into either a specific scientific discipline or a specific religion, you're settling some part of it. Now, that doesn't mean you're settling the whole thing. Maybe, as you're saying, Wes, some people do just say all the questions are settled, but I tend to think that anybody who's actually serious about their religion, some part of it is settled. You know, there is a God, blah, 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 but then there's still the question of, you know, what does God want me to do in this particular circumstance? There's, you know, it yeah. just becomes a tool yeah. for making the, asking questions of yourself more specific and fruitful. And of course, the scientist, I'm not equivocating the two by any means, science and religion, but of course, the scientist is doing the same thing is of saying, of rooting inquiry in a certain way based on certain assumptions that, methodological assumptions that are being granted for the purposes of you know, figuring out what the next question to ask or what the next experiment to set up is. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was, I was trying to say. I was going to give the limiting case of some type of fundamentalism, which, you know, maybe no one is that fundamentalist, right? No one is that closed minded really. Hmm. And then that's why, you know, I mentioned, well, yeah, your religious life could be just as 
as seeking and as open-minded as science or philosophy. And of course, closed-mindedness can play a role in all of those disciplines as well. But I would think entering on any of those disciplines involves closing some questions. Yeah. So you are closing your mind to some extent. If you think those are the important questions, then you're closed-minded, right? If, if, then the person who's doing that is, it would be closed-minded by your lights. Well, you mean the question of what's important, like a person who's focused on something that seems trivial or? No, I mean, if somebody has closed the question, say, of is there a God or, or not, and is entering on a religious life in which they say, yes, there is a God, well, I think that's a pretty big question to close. I don't think one can, with a serious intellectual conscience, really do that. I don't think there's the justification behind the notion of faith to allow people make the argument, well, we have to assume, say, that when I take the next step, the earth will still be under me. If I didn't assume that, then I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go about my daily life. And in the same way, I'm therefore going to make some sort of religious assumptions. I'm going to close, I'm going to have faith and close some part of the question off. So then I will be able to have more fruitful ethical analysis or think within that realm. And that leaves philosophy as far as I'm concerned. I don't think that really closes things though, because so suppose for instance, you said, all right, I'm going to create this axiomatic system of geometry and see where that leads, right? I, I'm going to see if I can make a consistent system out of that. So I'll deny the parallel postulate. I'll deny that any two lines that are parallel, that those lines will never meet or that they never get closer to each other, that, let's say. And you could say in Lopachev's in geometry that they do, and then you can build a consistent system out of that. You can make all sorts of assumptions all the time and run with those assumptions with the idea that they're revisable. I mean, there's a whole tradition of theology in which the question of whether God exists remains alive. Even though you say, I have faith in God, you don't simply push away any doubts about that. You allow yourself to doubt when you're feeling that doubt. You allow yourself to explore the question. You have a uh, the ability to take some distance from your own faith. I get that we're kind of touching on the boundaries between philosophy and religion, but how does that, what you're talking about, impact the question of why philosophy and how it helps you sort through those things? Because I'm making the claim that philosophy, the philosophical impulse, is all about this open-mindedness, that that state of mind can be transformative for life and it can be critical to all sorts of activities professional and otherwise it can be what makes a difference between a great writer and a mediocre writer it can inform whether or not someone is happy so i'm trying to get at some justification for the idea that socrates is right life does have to be examined in some sense to be worth living I was about to reference Socrates, so I'm glad you, you brought him up. There is a certain irony, and I guess we have to kind of agree that Socrates is in a weird way our kind of intellectual progenitor. At least for, for us, Socrates represents the beginning of philosophy. There are pre-Socratics, of course, and there's Eastern philosophy, and there are lots of different... but. With respect to what we see as philosophical undertaking and what we see as philosophy as an endeavor, Socrates is really the beginning of it, I think, for at least Plato's Socrates. And Wes, what I think is interesting about that is we have somebody who, on the one hand, takes to heart the idea that philosophy is somehow open-minded in a sense of this open-ended inquiry into the nature of things simultaneously brings in a social element by developing a methodology for doing that that's dialogic, that involves a give and take and is inquiry through mutual exploration, and yet is motivated by a god and in a certain way is also insufferable in the way of never reaching any kind of conclusions. And so <laughs> it's interesting to me, this kind of we woven in all those themes that what you just described to me, I hear it as being so true to the Socratic endeavor that it's kind of touching. I'm just looking at the apology again in preparation for this. And I tend to be very critical of 
what I see as an uncritical place in Socrates that he sees himself as driven by this divine voice, right? And just Mm -hmm. his having faith in the divine voice itself seems a point that he should be questioning and he should be less dogmatic about, but... Well, he doesn't have faith in it. He would never describe it as having faith in the divine voice. Right, but he follows its directives. He doesn't question it. He hears it. Because he has no choice. He's compelled. His daemon is something closer to his conscience than his faith. Yes. So that when I interpret it as an intellectual conscience, then I do think that it's really universalizable. I don't have a voice that I can use as a guide for virtue in the way that he does. But I do have that voice that says, are you really sure that what you just said (laughs) actually makes sense? That just picks at every every given thing that just is part and parcel of human self-reflection. And that that's how I in, interpret the kind of open-mindedness that Wes was talking about is just constantly at least being willing to question yourself. And well, it, is it constantly questioning yourself, which of course can be psychologically <laughs> debilitating. <pretty> damaging, debilitating <laughs> and not to mention just irritating Just a constant, even aesthetic dissatisfaction with with yourself and the way you just said what you just said and the fact that there's so much that you left unsaid Mm. in whatever you just said and so many points of view that you didn't look at it from and it's sort of always pulling you to the next level of analysis. So the partially examined life is just the idea that you have to stop (laughs) somewhere at least for a minute. You can pick it up later, but you're always going to be partially examined. Yeah, the whole idea of examination, right? In a way, it's about having opinions removed. It's more like excision or exorcism. And Socrates, in the Theotetus, compares it to midwifery, right? He's helping people give birth to these to these opinions. And I think, right, his job is to see whether they're not they're any good. And of course, they're never any good. An abortionist is not a midwife. He's an abortionist. Yeah, I know. I, that's the <laughs> conclusion I was trying to avoid. <laughs> that actually yeah. brings up a, a non-sarcastic <laughs> point that there's a sense in which philosophy, as Socrates conceives it, is a service. It's a service to the public. It's a service to the other individuals, even though it's annoying. It's not sitting at your desk. It's not a Cartesian undertaking where... You're isolated and and thinking through some things. It's that he honestly, if we believe him as the character that he's portrayed to be, he believed that he was doing something for the greater good. And the the midwife metaphor example obviously highlights that. And so the idea that philosophy is somehow an endeavor undertaken to benefit the public good, I think is something that gets lost and that we might spend a little more time trying to hold on to. There's a related description that Socrates has of the activity of philosophy, which is tying things down. And so he's constantly asking his interlocutors to help tie whatever thought they're mulling over down. Part and parcel to that is that you might go move on to another thought and try to tie it down, and it might not be exactly the same as the one you had before. But the activity involves not just wondering and not just questioning and examining, but part of that examination involves trying to sort it out. So there is, along with yep. the questions, an activity of trying to find answers. They may be provisional, they may be discarded at some point, But that examination is a following your nose down along a path, and then you may reel back and go do something else. But that activity of tying down is central to it. It's not just standing there wondering or feeling the the weight of the universe or whatever. It's a back and forth that also tries to sort out, to look for consistency, to be drawn towards inconsistency. Yeah, it it keeps you curious. The whole function of having these remo- these opinions removed and it's like the anecdote I told about being this arrogant little atheist know-it-all, right? And kind of being incurious about the world because of that. And that's really one of the, the important things about this examination, even though in some ways it seems so negative, right? To be 
relieved of one's cherished opinions and not to be given anything really solid in, in place of that. But what that creates is this kind of, and I'm, now I'm reminded of the importance of, say, desire in Hegel. It creates this ability to have and tolerate one's own desire instead of just sort of extinguishing it because it's so anxiety producing. So I'm thinking of Freud here as well, where we might deploy psychological defenses involving pretending to know things that we don't really know in order to prevent ourselves from having the anxiety of uncertainty. But uncertainty and desire, although they can be uncomfortable, they're really important to life. They're really important to leading a, a good life because they keep you curious and moving forward. And Dylan, as you mentioned, in this sort of exploratory relationship to the world, as opposed to being simply closed in on oneself and pseudo self-sufficient. Or even merely experiencing, going back a little bit to our previous discussion, but thinking about the inclination towards knowing or towards wonder and curiosity is and how it's different than other kinds of activities. I've looked out on a vista and really been impressed and felt a kind of contentment at being part of a world or gone through, you know, the excitement of riding a motorcycle fast and getting the my adrenaline running and going around curves and just sort of being immersed wholly in that, in some kind of activity that's just very exciting. But the times that I've felt most engaged and alive and really just felt like things were just coming together were when I was figuring things out. And when I was realizing that, oh, I got something right. And then later on being able to think, oh, well, no, I got this new thing yet that I have to sort out. That draw was always much stronger than other kinds of draws. And the closest I've ever come to feeling that same kind of pleasure out of figuring things out is the few times where I've done music, where I've been part of a band, where music just sort of all of a sudden was working together and I was one part of a whole that was resonating along and it worked all together. And that would be the closest thing to a similar kind of experience, which was different than this fulfilling experience of figuring something out, being stimulated by my curiosity and then moving on to something else. I think the comparison of the appeal of philosophy to the arts is very apt. Mm. And just as you were saying about the tying down, you know, the two parts of artistic practice are creation and then self-editing. And often those happen, of course, in the same burst, that it's really, it's inspiration and then on the fly self-editing. That's what really those together are what creation is about. And that's what makes the musical line that you just came up with feel right in a way that if you just did some random, ah, some random expression might not feel right in the same way. And then likewise, you can, you might create something that feels pretty good at the time. And then afterward, listen to the recording or look at the work and decide that it was crap in the same way. And then, you know, move your art forward in that way. And so it's, it's all about this long-term intellectual journey that is about whether it's for being an artist of some sort or in philosophy, of progressive dissatisfaction, yet joy in where you're at and moving on to the next thing, which is, I will give this as a post hoc rationalization for why we have given so much autobiographical stuff in this discussion, that it is relevant because it's a journey. You're reminding me of um, John Keats' use of the phrase negative capability. Keats, the great poet who died in his early 30s, but produced so much work before his death, he coined this phrase negative capability to describe basically, I'm going to look at the quote right here. It struck me at once, it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously, I mean negative capability that is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. This idea is that one can be, you know, it's especially important as an artist to be comfortable with uncertainty. 
as opposed to, again, pretending that I know the answer to something that I don't know, or let's say comfortable with moral ambiguity. So for Shakespeare, when he's representing a, a villain like Richard III, as someone with all the answers, or especially all the ethical answers, let's say an ethical dogmatist, well, it's not like Shakespeare doesn't know Richard III is a villain. We know he's a villain, but the way Shakespeare represents Richard III is such that we are charmed by him, we identify him, basically we can get into his head and there's no, the authorial tone, the artist doesn't take this condemning attitude. He's not injecting his moral and political opinions into the work of art. He's in a way suspending all of that. He's taking that sort of skeptical, ironic, or uncertain approach to things and leaving that out of his representation. Because if he were to do that, it would suck. He would suck as an artist if he were just giving you a cardboard cutout villain who you as an audience were simply supposed to have an uncomplicated feeling of hatred towards. So I was just trying to get at the sense in which this idea of an examined life in which we curate our uncertainty has implications beyond the actual doing of philosophy and its implications in the arts. Any closing thoughts on what is philosophy, why we're doing it? Why we're still interested in it. We've said a lot about how we got interested in it in the first place. Any more about its charms? Why <laughs> listeners slash readers should take it up? Yeah, there's like a bunch of things. So first off, I think it's really important for people to think about what they do and how that impacts other people's lives and the world and themselves and as much as we see all the TEDx things about neuroscience and, you know, there's this relentless push for everything to be controlled and measured and dosed and all this sort of thing, that ultimately you still have to conceive of yourself as a human agent and take responsibility for your action and care about what you do in this world. I think that's one part of it. I think another part of it is it's fucking fun. I really enjoy having these conversations and engaging and stimulating myself and challenging and learning from others and, you know, poking people with a stick. And I think there's an aesthetic component as well. A lot of the writing is very beautiful. I could just as easily say, hey, go read Dostoevsky or Gunter Grass or Kafka or Margaret Atwood or whatever. And those would be perfectly legitimate <laughs> ways to spend your time also. But there's a poetic nature in a lot of ways to a lot of the things we read. And there's a certain kind of joy that comes from reading something and where you, you know, a turn of a phrase or an idea that you hadn't considered or a way of considering something that you hadn't entertained before, where you just have this moment of wow. And, oh, hmm. And that's very satisfying. It's like, hitting a really great seven iron that lands on the green. It has the same sort of satisfaction in it, if I can use a golf analogy, which I'm sure none of you will understand. Analogically, Seth. Analogically. <laughs> <laughs> so there are any number of reasons to do this. And if anything, the fact that we've persisted for so long and that we have so many people listening and so many people who are engaged just validates my feelings about this. And the statistical data, if you want to, about how philosophy majors are successful in business and make um, entertaining friends and <laughs> in a certain way just validates it as well. I'll just add that my continued interest in philosophy as opposed to, you know, why don't I read a lot more popular or not so popular science journals? Why don't I read more history is a certain kind of impatience, and that seems very strange, given how much patience it takes to engage with difficult philosophical texts. But I still somehow find this easier and more gratifying when, if you put that kind of effort into a good philosopher, it's because they're giving you a whole different way of seeing the world. Whereas if you're putting a lot, a comparable amount of effort into understanding the details of neuroscience, say, then to me, that's just getting a lot of details that I will probably forget. <laughs> and so it's dissatisfaction with other, even though I think history and literature, and I even see the appeal of some theology, but it would really wear on me. It would not be sufficient variety for my tastes. 
I've ended up reading things that I would not have read before. And it's been usually more interesting than I thought it was going to be. (laughs) 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 Philosophy and reading philosophy is, for me, that kind of gift that keeps on giving that you can turn from one thing to another. and, And even if you were initially put off by it, it's almost always the case that you'll find something challenging or interesting that will fold into something new. And then the aspect of it that Seth just mentioned of that we have here on PL of having conversation about it and talking about these books to me is absolutely inextricable from it. And so that that part of it that goes back to Socrates in a marketplace or at a drinking party or wherever of having philosophical conversation and trying to ask big questions and little questions and sort them out and go through on what we think and why we think that is and challenging each other about it is just such a vibrant way to go about part of my day and it feeds into everything else that I do in just fantastic ways. I feel really fortunate to be able to do it in this particular venue with you guys, but I suspect that I would be doing it, you know, in some other way, other places as well. So, for everybody out there who listens to us, if all you're doing is listening, that's great, but you should also be talking to other people too. Join that school. <laughs> <laughs> you have any other closing, Wes? No, I, I like philosophy. That's my closing. <laughs> it's good. <laughs>